Okay, here we go. This evening's talk has been suggested quite coincidentally by two people. I was passed an email from Canada who was asking for a topic for a talk, and someone also came up to me and asked for exactly the same topic, which is uh, quite a coincidence, especially the topic has been something which I've never really focused on before. But it's an important topic because it occurs in people's lives, in modern lives. It's all about the ending of relationships, about what's the right time, how to do it, or should one do it, and all of the ways that we can uh, go through this time of a relationship ending and be able to use the opportunities skillfully for growth, for peace, for happiness, at least minimizing the pain. So today's talk is about ending of relationships. And I am warming to that theme simply because Buddhism is not just some sort of theory. It's not just something which is practiced in monasteries. It's not just something which you do on a meditation cushion. It's something which should give you guidelines to what happens in life. And unfortunately, some people you know, will have a relationship and sometimes the relationship starts to become weak, you want to know what should be done, is it repairable, or should one just call it a day, and how to call it a day in the most skillful, most compassionate way for everyone involved. But before I start, I'd like to also emphasize that there's a, a theme which runs through this talk, and it's a theme which I've been talking about quite a lot in the last couple of weeks. And that theme is just the way that we make decisions. Because when it comes down to it, there one is in a relationship. One has to make a decision about whether to continue, whether to keep going. And I think I mentioned, it could have been last week, but please excuse me because in the last week, I don't know how many Dhamma talks I've given, simply because I've been over in Sydney as soon as I left here on a Friday and then over to Sydney and given heaps and heaps of talks. seems every day, at least two or three talks. So I'm not quite sure when I said what and how and to whom, but nevertheless, there's a, a very powerful teaching in Buddhism about how to make decisions, or rather how not to make them, to make sure that one is never acting out of four things, and those four things are never acting out of desire, out of ill will out of stupidity and out of fear. And when we talk about those four things, when it comes to ending a relationship, so often those four things are all very active, which makes the decision-making process usually one which creates more pain and difficulty in our life and the life of others. So if you are in a situation where this might be happening, just check those four things, like a checklist, first of all. If I'm going to make a decision, where is that decision coming from? In particular, I'm going to go to the fourth factor, first of all, fear. Because too often, it is the fear which is the dominant force which you know, makes us either withhold a decision which needs to be made, or which bends the decisions just to out of fear. What really fear is, is just we're afraid of the consequences, we're afraid of what other people will say, and sometimes just afraid of doing anything. And of course, in our life, when we have that fear, it means that we aren't being wise, we aren't being constructive, we can't be compassionate. It is a fear which actually makes many decisions go in the wrong direction. So when there is a relationship there, are you afraid of staying? Are you afraid of breaking up? One of the things you should know that people, sometimes they stay, sometimes they break up, but it's never as bad as people really imagine it would be. It is fear which exaggerates the situation and makes the consequences appear uh, almost unendurable, which blows them up out of all proportion. I'm giving you many stories about what fear is, and sometimes if you go to a dentist and they say, I'm sorry, but this is going to hurt, it's going to really hurt, it's going to terribly hurt, then of course it will hurt even more. 
a good doctor or a good dentist will say, that's not going to hurt very much. Just a little prick, that's all there is. Ah! And so why do you tell me that? Because if I told you it, it would make it feel worse. So often it is a fear which exaggerates the pain. And this is why I remember that once when I was in hospital, I was in a ward with three other men, even though I was a monk, I was in a men's ward. It's fascinating because this was in, I think it was in Rockingham Hospital many years ago. And in my ward, first of all, when I arrived of a series of tests, they said, where are your pyjamas? And I said, I haven't got any pyjamas. Monks don't own pyjamas. And they said, you have to bring your pyjamas. And I said, it's either these robes or nothing. Take your pick. And they said, in that case, we'll have your robes. <laughs> so I wore my robes in the ward. And I remember one day, because there was a ward, there was a girls' ward next door. And one of the girls walked past on the way to... No, sorry, I walked past on the way to the toilet. And one of the girls actually screamed. She did thought it was one of her friends spooking her, she said afterwards. And so I made sure that next time they put me in a ward, it's not close to the cardiac ward, otherwise I might... <laughs> but anyway, in this room with three other men, as always happens, you're in there all day and all night. And so you talk to each other. And of course, I want to know what it's like to be a monk. I want to know what they were doing. And as conversations go, sometimes you start talking about stupid things. And what we started talking about was the worst medical procedure. <clears throat> And some of these guys have been in the hospital in and out. And somebody said, oh, you know, testing your liver, something, testing this. And then one guy said, look, I've been in the hospital. The worst thing is a barium enema. And so that's terrible. Oh, it's so painful. And this guy in the corner bed went white. I'm having a barium enema this afternoon. <laughs> what a stupid thing to start talking about. So we all laughed, that poor fellow, I don't know if he was laughing because he had to bear him enema in the afternoon. I don't know if it's the worst thing, but the point is, if we kept talking like that, it does become the worst thing. It's fear, it exaggerates the pain and negativity of whatever we experience in life. So first of all, make sure there's no fear when you start contemplating, you know, the end of a relationship. Because you find you do get through these things, and if you are wise, you can get through these things in a good way, in a way where you learn and grow and become better as a result. The breaking up of a relationship does not have to be negative. And this is something which I keep on saying here on a Friday night, that nothing in life needs to be looked upon in a negative way. As we say, the law of karma, the law of karma, the ingredients you have to work with in your life, whether it's a relationship which is failing or a good relationship which is blossoming, whether it's a life, whether it's a death, whether it's richness, whether it's poverty, whatever you have to deal with in life, that's the karmic ingredients you have to work with. But the most important part of karma is what you do with those ingredients. And it's how we deal with what we have is the most important part. And given many times the story of two ladies baking a cake, one's got terrible ingredients, one's got really good ingredients. I won't go in detail in that story. Who makes the best cake? The one with the best ingredients? Or the one with the worst ingredients? If you know whenever you're cooking, the ingredients are only a, a part, a small part usually, of the deliciousness of the meal. It's what you do with it is more important. How you mix those things together the effort, the care, the skill which you put in to baking a cake or making a meal is what makes it delicious. In the same way, a lot of times it doesn't matter what you experience in life. And what life gives you, the karmic results of your past, there you have the ingredients of your present moment. How are you using that? So we don't use fear because we know that whatever happens to us in life, we can make use of it. As I don't think this is a girl because I will leave her anonymous. She was saying to me just a few moments ago, 
that uh, you know, she had been attacked by a man a couple of years ago. She was thinking of maybe telling her friends' relations. I told her to put a positive spin on this. The positive spin is that the old story about treading in the dog poo. You tread in the dog poo in life. Sometimes the, the dog poo is the ingredients you have to work with. Sometimes the relationship can be painful, difficult, or whatever. Or you know, if it's a relationship which is falling apart, you know, it's dog poo when a relationship ends. But the great thing with dog poo is that you can dig it under your mango tree, which makes your mangoes taste more sweeter than the mangoes next door. And the point of that story always is, is whenever you taste those mangoes, remember, mmm, that is the dog poo. Transformed by nature in the same way just the relationship, the difficulties, the problems, whether it survives and you have to endure the difficulties of living with another person or you decide to break up. You can make it whatever happens. You can always make a beautiful mango out of dog poo, a beautiful garden out of manure. It's fertilizer. So the point is here, one doesn't need to be too afraid. Whatever happens... You can always make something out of it. You can grow, you can learn, you can be kind. You can advance on the path of knowledge, understanding, compassion, peace. So when we understand that, the fear factor can be diminished. When the fear factor is diminished, you now we know that, okay, you know, if we stay together, we'll be able to do something. Okay, if we split apart, we'll be able to do something. There's not this terrible, th this terrible, uh, what's it called? Uh, life and death situation. I must split or I must keep together. It's not so absolute. Because you know that sometimes that you know, people stay together and they work it out together and they endure together. And okay, it may not be the best in life, but it's good enough. You can get by, and sometimes you can make something out of that relationship. And if it doesn't have work and you decide to split up, you, you can still do something about that. And I've seen it many times as part of my job of being a monk, of being a bit of a marriage counsellor. Sometimes I wonder why they come and ask monks such questions. <laughs> so we've never been married. But nevertheless, you know, there is always, whether you're with your fellow monks, whether you're with your friends, it's all relationships. And so we get very skilled because we're mindful and alert. And it's at this particular point that mindfulness is always such a powerful factor in the second part about having wise decisions. Because when we're mindful, this mindfulness, this alertness, this openness of mind, it is a widening of your possibilities, a widening of the avenues which you can go along. Sometimes we think that there's only two choices, are we either split up or we stay together? But then when there's a mindfulness there, there's so many other doors, so many other possibilities can actually come up. For example, I remember that this one person was very wise. They had an argument with their wife very bad argument, and instead of splitting up, instead of thinking, should I just apologize right now, or should I sort of you know, go and say, right, this is it, what they did, because of their mindfulness, they saw another opportunity. There wasn't just two doors to go through, not just you know, breaking off the relationship or continuing on. They chose another door. They came to our monastery and hang out at the monastery for a week. It's a wonderful thing to do. Because one of the things that happens in a monastery, it's a place of peace and quiet, a calm time to reflect. And sometimes when we're making decisions, just we need to walk away from the heat of the situation to gain perspective. The perspective is like this. It's a simile I haven't given here for a long, long while. It's a simile of, what is the size of a hand? This is my hand over here. What is its size? 
It really depends on how close it is to me. Now my hand is so close to me, it blocks out the whole world. I cannot see all of you. I cannot see so the, the camera in the background. I cannot see anything at all. My hand is so big, it blocks out the whole universe. Now is it my hand's fault? Or is it the fact I've put it in the wrong place? If I put my hand where it belongs, which is at the end of my arm, sure I can see my hand, but I can also see each one of you as well. This is called perspective. Sometimes when we have the difficulties in our relationships, the problem, sometimes it's just too close to us. We cannot get a good perspective. And then if we make a decision on that, we're acting out of stupidity. Not really clear thinking. Not clear seeing. Which is why it is great whenever there's these life decisions to be made. These important decisions that accept, affect your happiness and the happiness of so many other people. We gain a means to walk away a little bit. To get a proper perspective. When it's so close, we miss so much. When it's out here... It's my relationship. Yeah, but there's more to life than just your relationship. You can actually see it, but you can see something more. This is the problem, but you can see more than the problem. This is a difficulty. You can see more than a difficulty. This is the happiness, but you can see more than the happiness. You get things in a big perspective, and a lot of times, to be able to do that, you've got to have a time of peace and quiet. A time to actually to take that thing which is which has been so important to you, and put it where it really belongs. Yeah, it's important, but maybe not as crucial. Because you see that so many difficulties and problems and things which people argue about, the sort of stuff which does break up a relationship. Sometimes when they tell me those courses, I think, what are you breaking up for, for such small things? It's only a tiny thing. And they haven't always done that. Now that story which... Uh, Somebody told me in Malaysia, it's not, it's not they told me, but an experience I had in Malaysia when I was teaching at a university, gave a talk on Buddhism, a question time afterwards, somebody put their hand up and said, my husband has lied to me, I've caught him out, I can't trust him anymore, should I break off the relationship, should I get divorced? And that's what they said. Because if you can't trust anybody, especially their partner, can you stay with them anymore? Because isn't like, you know, a relationship built on this trust? And somebody's lied to you. So I put it in perspective. She had the lie right in front of her, and that's all she could see, the lie. So I said, Madam, what are you doing in this university? She said she was a lecturer in mathematics. So I said, let's do some statistics. How long you been married to that guy? said about three years. I said, let's call that 1,000 days. Let's assume that every day your partner, your husband has said 20 things to you on average, which could be right, which could be wrong. That's in the time since you were married, he said 20,000 things to you. Now he's lied for the first time. So you should know, lecturer in mathematics, that according to statistics, probability theory, it means on his past record, the next time he says something to you, there's a 20,000 to 1 chance he's telling the truth. And I said, isn't that trustworthy? I think that's pretty trustworthy. If our politicians had a 20,000 to 1 chance of telling the truth, that would be amazing. So because of that, she saw what I was you know, pointing out, the lie was so big that's all she can see and she couldn't see anything else and this is the one thing with wisdom that if we can keep things in perspective i think that would actually save so many relationships because it's the one lie which is all we see which breaks the relationship it's the one mistake it's the one time when the person hasn't done the right thing and we just cannot see all the other times when they have done the right thing, when they have been the perfect husband, the wonderful wife, the caring partner. And how come it is that just a few mistakes is all we see, and that is what breaks the relationship. So whenever you're contemplating breaking the relationship, 
Ask yourself why. Ask yourself why not. See what the problems are, what the benefits are, and put them in a proper perspective out here. Because when I put my hand out here, sure I can see my hand, but I can also see other things as well. This is a psychology which I have learned as a monk by meditating for so many years. Too often, our mind just focuses on just half of life, actually less, quarter, a tenth of life, and then we're blind to everything else. So when we're making decisions, if we have going to be wise, we have to be fair. So when you're making a judgment, you've got to really stand back and see the situation as you would imagine other people see it. Get out of your shoes and look at it from a distance. Which is why taking a retreat, taking time out, relaxing, whatever it is you do, like coming to a monastery for a few days, then maybe that's a good opportunity. However, there was this one lady who came and told me once, because in Thailand very often when... Ladies have problems with their husbands. They always come and stay in a monastery. So much so that she became afraid of coming to our monastery because she was afraid what other people would think of her. She came to the monastery so often, they would tell her, oh, you might be having trouble with your husband. <laughs> she said, no, no, I just love coming to the monastery. There's no trouble at all. Yeah, that's what they all said. The only reason to come to a monastery is because you're having marriage trouble. But that's not obviously the case. But that was the case sometimes in some monasteries in Thailand. The only time people would go to the monastery is if they're having difficulties. But the point being here is that the monastery does give you all the, the retreat, the space, the time out, does give you the time for getting that perspective, which is just so important to be able to make proper, wise decisions. And if you're going to save that relationship... It's the same attitude which I was talking to someone today to actually to overcome guilt, to overcome anger, to overcome negativity. If a person, another person, you want to destroy them, you want to reject them, you're angry at them, you want revenge on them because they've hurt you, how can you forgive somebody else? How can you put aside the faults in the relationship and move forward? How can you do that? How can you forgive yourself sometimes if you've done a terrible thing? As another lady asked me afterwards, she's working in a prison, she was uh, trying to counsel a murderer. How can the murderer forgive himself and, and move on? And the way to move on is actually the way to forgive yourself and others, there is a standard first step. And that standard first step is to look and find, to discover something in that object of your anger and rejection, something which is worthy of respect. To see something which deserves saving. It's like if you've got you know, like a, a house which has been you know, worn down, broken up or something. If there's something which is worth saving, you don't bulldoze it. It's the same as if there's somebody who's really hurt and harmed you. If you can see something in them which you can respect, which you can actually uh, see is worthy, then that becomes the start of forgiveness. You find they're not all bad. A lot of times, the revenge, the guilt, the destruction... It always comes about when we see there's nothing worth saving in that anymore. There's nothing worth keeping. And sometimes we want to destroy another person because of that. Sometimes we want to destroy ourselves. Sometimes we want to destroy a relationship because we see nothing, nothing in there at all, which is worth keeping, which is worth saving, which is worth building on. You know that if you have even a spark, you can soon get a fire. And if you have just a seed, soon you can get a whole forest. A little bit is all you need to grow into something great. And this is why, if we see in our relationship, there is something there, a little bit there, which is worth saving, which is worth respecting, then you can save that relationship. 
a lot of times the growth, the keeping together, comes from respect. You know, those of you who've been through a relationship and it's broken up, at that time you want to break up, you can't see anything which you respect in the other person. Those of you who've been into guilt and depression, you can't see anything in yourself in guilt, which is worthy of forgiveness and depression. You can't see anything in life, which is worthy of celebrating. The whole thing looks black. The first thing you have to do is actually deliberately look somewhere for something which is redeeming. And once you start to see that, it's so easy to forgive somebody else. You can see something good in them. Oh, I remember when I was visiting my mother some years ago, there was this guy walking down the street and there was you know, some old building in the south of England somewhere collapsed. And this guy was out of work, he was a pretty no-hoper. He had a relationship, a marriage, but his wife was actually fighting for divorce, I think, at the time. He raced into this uh, building and it was a hero who managed to save a couple of kids. And he was a, you know, he risked his own life. It was a very heroic thing he did. I remember listening to the news in my mother's flat. And they're interviewing this man's wife. He was in hospital with you no know, wounds. He was going to recover this man. His wife said, look, I was about to divorce this guy. Now I've seen what I, he did. I'm going to carry on this relationship with the guy. She saw something in her husband that he, she'd forgotten. Something really worthwhile, something redeemable. And that was enough to keep the relationship together, something to work on. So a wonderful way of actually solving relationship problems is looking at the relationship, looking at the partner, and deliberately stopping looking at all their faults, what's wrong with them, the time they lied, the time... Look at something which you can love in them and you can care for, that you can worship even, some redeemable thing which you can really respect. Once you have that, what usually happens, you can see something else which you can respect in them, and something more. It's an old psychological trick. Once you can see something good, it's as if you've taken your, your head and turned it from the left to the right. When you turn to the left, all you can see is the bad. You turn it to the right, you can see the other side. A lot of times, the way we reject people is only can we see half the story, half that person. And this is something which I've learnt as a monk. Sometimes I can't reject any of you. <clears throat> I don't care who you are and what you've done. Sometimes, again, I've been into the jails and seen some gross people, some really mean and nasty people, but my goodness, I can see something good in them. But it's great when you see something beautiful in the worst of offenders. It's amazing what, how they treat you. Because if you see something beautiful in a rapist, in a murderer, in a sort of a, you know, a felon, a hoodlum, then they can see it in themselves. Some of the guys I used to teach in prison, they were sort of guerrillas, real meanies. But because I looked at them and saw something else other than their crime, other than their history of violence, I could see something soft inside of them. It was wonderful just the way that they warmed and they became great friends. If you saw their crime, if you saw the hurt they did to somebody else, the murder, the violence, if that's all you saw, there's no way you can forgive those people. If you saw something else, then that's what they would show back to you. One of the ladies who was a nun in Thailand in very early years, she was from England before she became a Buddhist nun. She worked in Holloway Prison in London, especially with Myra Hindley. Those of you might know that she was one of the most notorious uh, women prisoners in the British penal system. She's known as the Moors Murderess. Together with her partner, they would abduct children, torture them before they kill them, and they would record the screams and the pleas for mercy on an audio tape. 
sadism, the cruelty, which is immense. And rightly they were jailed for life. They had to be in protective custody because even other prisoners would try and kill these two for what they did to children, not one but many. It's one of the worst crimes. But this nun told me that she'd worked with Mohini and found her a beautiful woman, kind and spiritual. And of course, for many people, they would say that is impossible, but that is the truth. In his worst of criminals, there can be this beautiful part. And if that's what you see, that's what they show back. It's the same with those people who have want to end the relationship with themselves. In other words, called suicide, depression. It's only because we only can see the negative inside of ourselves. We can't see anything good inside of ourselves. But if you can make that breakthrough, see the first thing of respect in oneself, the first bit of beauty, if that's what you can see in yourself, that's what yourself shows you back. That's what grows. To put it in brief, the way I put it in brief so people can remember this, when you've got a garden, if you water the flowers, the flowers are what grows. If you water your weeds, it's the weeds which grow. What well, that simile means, if you encourage the beauty, the goodness, the things you can respect, that grows. But how many of us in relationship water the weeds? That's all we talk about, that's all we think about, that's all we contemplate. That's why those things grow. So we have to be wise in a relationship. We have to actually know how to have that relationship and how to make sure that we don't go off thinking about things, perceiving things in an unwise way because that will hurt us and hurt other people. So we make a decision, please, open the mind, be wise. It's incredible what you can do with wisdom some of the most hopeless relationships and keep going. Change of attitude through wisdom, widening the mind. And that's why any of you who come here and learn meditation and really get into this Buddhism business, well, you can have a relationship with almost anybody. I do. <laughs> go here, go there. Relationship with the Benedictine monks, with Jews, with Muslims, I don't care. And that relationship is a relationship of respect. Seeing something in the other person, I can really respect. What was it? That some years ago, a couple of years ago, I was invited to go to Christchurch School to give the, the morning, um, what's it called? Morning Assembly. Christchurch School, this is an Anglican school, isn't it? Yeah, Anglican School. And so, um, Frank Sheehan was the chaplain there, a great guy. I don't, I don't think he knows whether he's a Catholic or an Anglican because he was once, once was one and then is another. I think he doesn't care either. He's just a good guy, a spiritual fellow. But the headmaster was an Anglican. And so as we were walking into the chapel before the, the assembly, there was a headmaster who said, now listen, uh, there's a little shrine in there, a Christian shrine. You're a Buddhist monk. We usually bow, but you don't have to bow to the Christian shrine. And I took offense. I said, why not? I demand my right to bow to the Christian shrine. To be a Buddhist. I said, I can still see something in Christianity which I really respect. And that is what I'm going to bow to. Okay, I'm a Buddhist. There's obviously many things in Christianity I don't agree with. But nevertheless, there's some things which I can agree with. Therefore, I can respect it. I can bow to it. I can have Christians as my friends. I can have relationships. Now, monk relationships with the you know, Benedictine monks in Eunosia. Now you can understand how relationships can work and they can keep on going and they can keep on building with that wisdom. A lot of times that the other two factors we make uh, decisions on, desire and ill will. Now, what's desire? We may be thinking of having another partner. We're fed up. We want something else. An ill will, I'm not fed up with this. You get angry. As soon as you get angry, you get into this 
whole um, perversion of perception where you can only see what justifies your anger. You know what that's like when somebody's angry at you. Whatever you do, they just use it as evidence to justify their anger. Even if you're kind, it's too late. You should have been kind earlier. So that doesn't matter. I'm kind now. The point being, when we're angry, when we're upset, we just don't see things fairly. Same when we have desires, something we want out of this, we don't see things clearly. So we should never ever make a decision out of desire, ill will, stupidity or fear. So the first thing you should do is to make sure that those aren't there when you're making a decision to continue a relationship or to end it. Sometimes those decisions are hard. Kids involved, finances involved, you know, a huge number of parents involved, you know, your life involved, your business is involved. So what you always do is put everything you can possibly find into the balances. But you don't need to worry about it. It's a worry about worry when we make decisions, which means that the decisions are just all out of fear usually and stupidity. We make wrong decisions again and again and again. To say about desire, why people make decisions out of desire, a good example of that is a story told to me by Ajahn Sumaita many years ago, because when he first went to visit his hometown, he met one of his friends from high school. And as soon as she saw him, she said, Oh, it's wonderful you're here. You can come to my wedding. I'm getting married next week. He said, oh, that's, congratulations, you're getting married. Yes, this is number seven. <laughs> There's seven, you've been married, married seven times. And because he was an old friend, you know, she, he could ask, why? What are you doing this for? And she said, she said, oh, I love sort of the dating. I love falling in love. That's beautiful. You meet someone and you fall in love. And I, it's great, sort of, you know, the time when they propose to you and you say, yes. And the planning, the wedding, and all the, the friends and everything else, that's great, that's the best part. And even the wedding ceremony, you know, wearing white, all of your aunties crying and everybody else. I said, oh, that's beautiful. And she said, it's what happens after the wedding I don't like. So, a few days after the wedding, wedding, we get divorced, and I start all over again. At least she was honest. You know, there's some truth in that. I could respect a person like that in some respects. There's always something you can respect because it is sometimes the best part, isn't it? <laughs> but, and of course, that's just uh, ending the relationship out of, <laughs> out of desire. It's not a very good way of going about things. So make sure you're not acting out of desire, ill will, stupidity or fear. And then you make a cool decision, you put everything, program it into your mind. Now obviously I don't do this with relationships, but I do this with other decisions which I have to make as an abbot, as a spiritual director, as a boss of a Buddhist society. I put everything into my mind, as much information, clear information as I possibly can. And then I leave it. I don't even worry about it. Because of meditation, I've got a great ability just to let things go. Put it in to really get the, the research and then leave it alone. And completely just relax, go and do something else, read a newspaper. Go and give a Dhamma talk, give a talk at Nolama or whatever. And I just wait. One day or two days, three days at the most. The answer always comes. When I wait for that answer... When the answer comes, you can recognize it. Yeah, this is obvious. This is what I should do. And I always follow that. And of course, you know, it's been a, have a successful monastery, a successful Buddhist society. Maybe in the world I'm not much of a success. I've got no superannuation, stuffed away from my retirement, no money, no possessions, no family to speak of. But I'm pretty successful as a monk, so it must be working well. And that's how I make decisions. So if you have a relationship and you're not quite sure whether you should carry on or whether you should stop, put all the information in. 
clearly, without fear, without stupidity, without desire, ill will, and leave it alone. See what answer comes out. If the answer is to carry on a relationship, then there's many strategies you can actually use to actually, obviously the relationship was in trouble, to make it better for goodness sake. There you are, you've got the relationship, you're going to keep it going for a while. Put some more effort, but not willpower, wisdom power into your relationship. Don't just you know, think of yourself, as I said last week, don't think of him, don't think of me. I think of what's between the two of you. Because too often the relationships end when you think of what I want, what I need, my, my problems, my this or my that. Or you think of what he needs, what she needs, what their problems are. Both are the wrong places to look. We look for what's between us. It's a relationship problem. It's not his problem. It's not her problem. It's what's between us. If you look in the right place, it's incredible what you can do with a relationship and how you can actually, you know, you may only have a, the last flower in the whole garden left and the rest is all full of weeds. And once you know what to do, you can water that flower and that flower just takes over and smothers the weeds after a year or two and get it back again if you're wise. If that's a decision which comes up, we have strategies, ways to build on what you've got and to help make that relationship flourish again. You start to think about why you fell in love in the first place. And what you saw in that person you really respected. You gained respect again. And just how you got that relationship going. The care, the effort, all of the concern which you showed in those early days. You show it again. You realize that why that relationship started to go wrong. It's because you were careless. Meditation or mindfulness is not just being alert, it's being caring. What I say, and I gave this talk in my monastery on Wednesday night, whatever you do, give it everything you've got, 100% in your life. Don't be lazy. Sometimes lazy, we think, oh, that means that I've got to go to work. It's not just work, it's when you're with somebody, be with them. Put that effort and that energy, that life, into whatever you're doing. And they can see that when I give a talk, I really put everything I've got into it, no matter how tired I am. When I talk to you, I give it everything I've got. This is something which my predecessor, Ajahn Jagro, told me once. He said, I've been watching you for years. And so whatever you do, if it's laying bricks or writing a letter or doing whatever you do, you always give it, you know, 100%. That has been my character. I don't know where I got that from. But that's what you should do in your relationships. If you give that care, 100% care, you can just be successful. You can get anything back together again. It's only because we've got 90%, and that's all. That's why the relationship doesn't last. But if you decide the decision does come up, it's irredeemable. It's just like a an old car, it's a waste of time trying to keep it going, it's just you know, beyond its use by date. Then first of all, understand that that is also part of nature. We make a lot in Buddhism about impermanence, anicca, the things change, the relationships, that they come, eventually things die away, they go, every tree one day will die. It's just part of life, it's impermanence. But when that happens, if that's a decision you make, that it is, impermanent, it's dead, it's gone. Then don't allow negativity to come up. Because after a great relationship, sure it's dead now. Don't blame the other per person, don't blame yourself. Because that's sometimes what happens when we have a, f a relationship, we say it's a failed relationship. When it's a fail, you want to blame somebody. It's not a failed relationship, it's just Things have come, things have gone. It's impermanent. It's the nature of all things. So when we don't blame anybody, then a lot of the problems of broken relationships just completely vanish. We don't blame ourselves. We don't blame others. It's nature. In the same way that after the tsunami, 
I came up here and I said, look, you can't blame, blame God. You can't blame the people who was their karma. It's just life. This is what happens. In the same way, the soldier who got shot once and went to see Ajahn Chah to complain, why me? Ajahn Chah said, what do you expect? That's what happens when you become a soldier. People shoot at you. And some of those bullets are going to hit. It's par for the course. In the same way, when the relationship starts to fall apart, what do you expect? That's what happens. In some relationships, that's what they do. So don't think it's his fault, or it's her fault, or it's somebody else's fault. This is life. Before you get into a relationship, Please read the small print. Carefully, yeah. This is what happens. It might work, it might not work. But whatever happens, you can always a lot you can learn from it. There's a lot you can grow from it. If it's have a wonderful relationship, that's great. You're happy. Well done. If it doesn't work, wonderful, great, well done. You've got more of the dog poo to, for your mango trees. Whichever way. That positive attitude can always a winner. You don't blame anybody. It's life. And in Buddhist attitude towards life, the impermanence of life, life and death, and rise and fall, fortune, misfortune, what the Buddha called the, the worldly dhammas, he said, this is what we learn from. This is the, the fertilizer for the spiritual life. This is how we grow. This is where compassion comes from. Is the building blocks of the most beautiful part of life. If everything went so well for you in your life, you would not be a beautiful person. You do need the difficulties, the troubles, the poo to fertilize your compassion, your wisdom, your sense of being a human being, a beautiful one. So when these things happen, we can say, right, no blaming. What are we going to do about this? Every time someone comes to complain about, oh, he said this, or he did that, she did that, it's her fault, she broke off the relationship. No, it's because he didn't care. Look, stop blaming people when the relationship ends, especially in a marriage. You start blaming people in a marriage, and look what happens. You have this incredible acrimony, and that is really, really painful. So it's ended. This anicca, it happens. Like the soldier being shot, it's nobody's fault. It's not your fault, it's not her fault or his fault or anybody's fault. It's just life. What comes together will one day part. When one understands that, one can accept these things without any blame. And of course, it's incredible what you can do if there's that degree of acceptance. You can say, okay, well, it's, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to hurt the kids. I don't want to hurt anybody. Here we are. Now, what can we do about this? When the people come to me and complain, I say, look, stop complaining. Instead, let's see what we're doing about this. Like after the tsunami, when the newspapers rang up, I said, look, stop blaming God. Stop blaming karma. Stop blaming anybody. As the longer you waste time blaming, the longer it will take to actually to do something. Look, there's people over there who need houses, need food, need medicine. If we waste all our time finding who's to blame, we're not actually doing anything. So stop blaming the cause. It's there, it's happened, now let's get on with it. Let's do something positive. So I, I didn't have give any shrift to blaming anybody after the tsunami. So what are we doing about it? Let's put all that aside. We can discuss that later on. There's work to be done. So whenever there's a split relationship, it's ended. Instead of blaming somebody whose fault it is, there's work to be done. There's two lives there, sometimes three lives, four lives, five lives with the kids. There's something which needs to be done. It's a tsunami has hit your relationship. There's somebody without a house, people without the spiritual home, the home of love, without the food. 
It's like people destitute. Now let's make sure everyone's got a home and food and love and kindness. So we don't blame. We work in a positive way to see now, here it is, what can we do about this? And with that degree of, that sort of attitude, it's amazing just how when people split up in a relationship, even if there are kids, it's not a negative thing after all. Because the people, even the kids, realize, yeah, relationships are like that. They may last, they may fade away and disappear. Welcome to life. They're learning about the realities of life. But if their you know, their parents can actually show the way and say, yes, you know, people come, people go, friendships, relationships sometimes disappear, but this is the way we can deal with it. Not blaming, without anger, without aversion, but in a positive way. We can see, okay, now what can we do? Relationship's over. Let's see how we can deal with this in a compassionate, kind way, in a fair way. So this is why the Buddha would never allow any justification for revenge, no matter what a person did. He gave this beautiful simile of the saw, which is one of the most powerful teachings of the Buddha. So powerful that when I was in Sydney, someone asked, can you actually really do that? The simile of the saw was this. If somebody comes, like bandits, thieves, thugs, and they hold you down, and they saw your limbs off with just a, a, a ordinary saw, not a chainsaw or a circular power saw, but a slow saw, torturing you for no reason. He says, if you have just one thought of ill will towards your torturers and your abusers, you're not a disciple of mine, said the Buddha. What he was actually saying, there was never any justification at all for revenge or anger, even if somebody was abusing you, and you were faultless, and they were harming you, even torturing you. It's a powerful, powerful teaching, because in our world we always seek some justification. Yeah, you've hurt me. That shouldn't have been done. Right. That justifies my anger and ill will, trying to hurt you back. I remember reading this one story. This couple, they were the British married to a United States. I think the, the woman was British. He was a, a U.S. citizen. And to get her own back on him, because she really wanted revenge, she still had the keys to his apartment in New York. She went in there on the weekend when he, she knew he was away for the weekend. She picked up his telephone, rang the international code for the automatic time in London and left the phone off the hook because it was like an automatic answer phone it would go on and it did go on for about 50 hours until he came home and so he was faced with this huge bill 50 hours of international telephone calls in those days it was you know, a few thousand about ten thousand dollars or something just out of wanting revenge of course, that's a stupid thing to do. We want to do that for. What does that really help? That's actually not the Buddhist way at all. So if a, re a relationship does start to unravel, okay, what are we doing about this? No blaming anybody. No wanting to hurt anybody. What can I do about this? This is my situation right now. Here it is. What can I do about it? And there's always something positive you can do, no matter what you experience. And you're showing your kids and other people that if a relationship does fall apart. It doesn't mean your principles, your kindness, your love, your wisdom, that doesn't need to fall apart. You can still be a beautiful person and say, well, this relationship has died. There's nothing left, nothing worth saving anymore. But I'm not going to get angry at you or angry at myself. It's been a wonderful time together. Thank you so much. Today, this afternoon, I had a funeral service which I took. I said the same old story again and again. The story of my father's death. 
You know that story, many of you. I looked upon my father's life as a concert. When the concert ended, I never felt sad. Concerts have to end. But instead I thought, what a wonderful time that was we had together. Sixteen years. It's a beautiful life. Thank you so much, Father, for being there. I never felt sad to this day at the death of my father. In fact, I was grateful for it, for the time we had together. A son with his father is a relationship. Partners in a marriage, whatever. They're gay partners, heterosexual partners, married or just unmarried. It doesn't matter. When you're together for that time, if it does end, can't you have the same attitude as I had for the death of my father? No anger, no remorse, no blaming, no negativity, but looked upon your relationship as this amazing concert you had. You're so grateful to that person you shared your, your months, your years with. A concert has to end. It's ended very shortly, very soon. But thank you so much for all the times we've had together. So we don't need the negativity. So what I'm saying here, whether the relationship carries on or whether it stops, make sure you make the wise decision by checking you don't act out of fear, out of stupidity, desire or ill will. Make that decision clearly. Whatever happens, if you carry on, there's many strategies we can help you with to keep that relationship going. You have to see something you respect in that partner. Focus on what's between you. Not on her, not on him. There's a good chance he can keep going. But putting all the ingredients, all this sort of the data in, if it comes out, yeah, it's got to end. The concert has ended. No need to be negative about it. Okay, maybe a little bit painful, but that's just fertilizer, pure mango tree. And make sure that this is what you're experiencing. This is it. How you're experiencing it. You can always make something of it. Make it positive. Make it beautiful. Like the story of a concert. It's, it's ended our relationship. But it's been a wonderful time. Think of all the beautiful things which you've experienced together. Thank you. And one thing I'll tell you to finish off. There's always another concert coming next week. Just says there's always another talk here in Dhammaloka every Friday night. So don't be sad that this one is ending now. Sister Wayama is coming next week. Thank you. Okay, so that's an interesting topic, and I really thank the two people, one from Canada and one from here, who suggested that copy. I've really given it my very best. If it's not quite good enough, as things I missed out, I am a monk after all. Are there any questions about what I've been talking about this evening? Yeah. Mm. Um, well, a lot of time, the, the reasons for being in a relationship, sometimes you haven't got much choice, you just find yourself in one. And if you how did that happen? But there you are. So remember that life, as you should know by now, is completely out of control. We think that really that we can control it, that we're in you know, uh, command of our destiny. But I think many of you know by now that you're not. <laughs> Things happen, life happens. And your job is that you can't actually control about what happens to you in life, but you can control how it happens, how you respond to it. And that's the most important thing in life. You have a relationship, if that happens... Yeah, make make something out of it. If it falls apart, make something out of it. If you're single for a long time, make something out of being single. If you have a, a great partnership, make something out of it. The ingredients of your life, you can't control those. 
you're rich, you're poor, you win the lottery or you lose everything in your business, you get cancer or you're healthy. Oh my goodness, I was telling somebody the other day, my grandmother, she drank alcohol, whiskey, I don't know how much whiskey she drank, she smoked, she, no, her main food was fish and chips, really greasy, I mean this old type of fish and chips, I think nowadays they put them in like canola oil or something, just really greasy lard, pig fat, whatever it was, they used to cook it with, and she lived to 96. And she just died of a fall, just old age. No cancer, no heart problems, nothing. She survived a blitz in London. She was indestructible. So it's, just, it's not just the ingredients of life, it's how you deal with it. She always had this positive attitude towards life. So it's that's actually what's important. The in, not the ingredients of your life, but how you re relate to them. So yes, sometimes it might happen, Chris, that a beautiful lamppost might come into your life. <laughs> if it does, how did that happen? My goodness. <laughs> okay. It's the same as actually, like if in a separation. It's not the separation which is the problem, how you relate to that separation. You stay together, how you relate to staying together. That's the important part. Yes, yeah, sorry? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. The the pain you cause other people. Sometimes you don't cause other people pain. Sort of my happiness and my suffering, same as your happiness and your suffering, completely your concern in that respect. We allow ourselves to be hurt. That's why I've got this, this saying, which I follow, I never allow other people to control my happiness. So I give a stupid talk, I'll give a stupid answer to that wonderful question. You say, Ajahn Brahm, that was really ridiculous and stupid. I'm not going to worry about that, because I know I make mistakes. <laughs> I'm not going to allow myself to lose sleep over anything, because I know that it's my, the ingredients which, which are presented to me in life, the ingredients aren't the problem. You may kick me, you may call me an idiot, but that's just the ingredients. Now, what am I doing with that? What we want to see is that really we don't cause pain or suffering to other people. So see, other people allow themselves to be hurt. And they, sort of, they throw away their chance of happiness. So because of that, if you have done your very best you, have, you haven't gone out to hurt the other person. You try to be compassionate and the best. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, some people are always going to take it in the wrong way and they are going to be hurt. But it's basically it's their fault. Not yours, not mine. Look, you know, when I became a monk, now I hurt my mother. Not because I was being a monk, because I was living such a long way away in Thailand. But, you know, I realized that I needed to do this, and I had to do this. It was good in the end for my mother. She got much more out of it. So sometimes, you know, that was like a son-mother relationship, and it was like a, a breaking off because I would have to be a monk. So if that actually happens, you not, you know, the whole purpose is not to hurt the other person. That's... But their response to what you're doing goes in the equation. You put that in the balance. You're about to end a relationship. I'm going to hurt them, but this, whatever happens. It would be wonderful if each one of us had the proper good Buddhist attitude. So that, you know, your partner would not be hurt. They would say, look, I'm really disappointed. I really loved you and cared for you. But that is marvelous dog poo you've given me. Thank you, you know, my loved one that when our relationship ended, you gave me the most wonderful gift, you know, the, the heartache, the pain, the dog poo, which is, I know it's going to make me a wonderful person. Thank you, darling, as you go off with your new partner. Now that is a Buddhist attitude. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people could do like that? And then, you know, you wouldn't... Have this terrible fear about, you know, you're going to hurt somebody else. 
And of course, you know that I'm not being sexist here, but I think many people would agree that it's the women who are just so afraid of hurting others, especially their partners. And sometimes they just want to hurt themselves. They just allow themselves to be hurt too much. Care about your partner, but also care about yourself. And especially care what's in between the two of you. So it's a factor, but it shouldn't be that big a factor. And there's other factors as well. Does that sort of answer the question? Okay, there's one on the back over there, yeah? That's a really big question, and I don't want to just to pass it over, but it's a huge question to answer in you know, one or two minutes. But generally speaking, it's you know, the, our compassion. We try and do the very best we can. We will never will be perfect, because this is not a, a perfect place. This is like a school where people are, you know, they go into the school without knowledge, needing to be trained. So I look upon, you know, people who, you know, are that kind and caring to animals, to be, you know, the sort of the, the university graduates, the high minded people. But they should never really look down upon the low minded people, you know, who still are very quite cool, like the farmers or the fishermen or something. You know, these are people who are learning. Because I remember that as a vegetarian when I was a lay person. When my mother would, you know, eat it and have a have a sausages or whatever, because we had to share the same frying pan for my, um, was it bean rissoles? I would scrub that frying pan until it was so many times, and I could not walk past a butcher shop. I had to go the other, and I looked upon all of my friends who ate meat, carnivore, carnivore, carnivore. Yeah. I was just over the top there. So I never try and look down upon anybody. I respect people who are kind and caring. I respect the animals as well. And if an animal is kind, respect them. But I never hit the cat when it catches a mouse. That's the best the cat can do. I try and encourage the cat not to catch the mice. You know what we do with the mice we catch in our monastery? Well, I don't do that these days, but cause I think I told it in a talk one day. Whenever we used to catch our, the mice in our kitchen, we'd have like a Buddhist mouse trap. You know, we just wouldn't kill the mouse, we'd just trap it. And we would take it and release it at Karna Prison Front. It was karma. It is stolen from the monastery, so if it should go to prison. <laughs> Makes sense to me. So that's how you could read cards. We have to put it somewhere anyway. That's a big question. Can you please ask it again next time? Because I, there's no way I can answer that adequately in the time which I have. So be your heart's in the right place. and See how kind we can be. Relationships with animals, with people, with everything. And I think we may make it a nicer place, a more peaceful place. But especially I was focusing on relationships with men and women, you know, men and men, women and women, and other relationships. Because that causes huge amounts of pain. And I really, again, to sum up, thanks for those people who asked me to uh, talk about that because you know, I would never have thought of talking about that myself. And it's something which Buddhists should address. Yeah. So hopefully I've, I've made a contribution there to that huge problem in your life. Thank you.